Welcome to Prescribing Prosperity with your hosts, John and Alex Sutsos from MedWealth Financial Services, operating through IPC Securities Corporation. In this podcast, we provide unique insights into wealth management, the psychology of financial decisions, and help listeners place the capital markets into perspective. Our aim is to help physicians, business owners, and other medical professionals to live their dream. Life is to live and enjoy, so we'll also cover health and lifestyle-related topics such as food, dining, travel, and unique experiences. Learn how global trends shape our investment strategy as we help you assemble your roadmap to prosperity. Welcome to the Prescribing Prosperity Podcast with your hosts, John and Alex Sousos. Guys, good to be with you. How are you? I'm Very doing good, great. Bill. Now, I'm looking forward to this topic today because it kind of brings together what appear to be disparate, different topics that you've covered on podcasts in the past. Because today we're going to be talking about Web3 technology and building design. And to help us with that conversation, there's a fellow named Andy McKay. And Andy is the founder and managing director of Digital Inc., a pioneering firm in the digitization of property, encompassing geomatics, BIM, and digital twins. Their operations span across the UK and Canada with unique business model that includes collaborating with local companies for on-site activities and leveraging international talent for digital production. So without further ado, let me welcome Andy. Andy, nice to have you with us today. Thanks, Bill. Hi, Alex. Hi, John. And thanks, to, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Good Bill, to see you again, good, Andy. Yeah, good to see We're you. looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And without further ado, let me hand this over to Alex. Alex, take it away. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Andy, for coming on. Andy and I first met uh, a couple of months ago uh, through our colleague and friend, Skylar Stankowski, who joined us earlier in the podcast to discuss uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. Andy, I believe, is, uh, is or Skylar, I should say, is working in Andy's office. And so the the two of them have been working together on some uh, some projects together. And so uh, Skylar was telling me for a while, he goes, you got to come meet my friend Andy at the coffee shop. And uh, so Skylar and I uh, and, and Andy periodically go to, they go out more frequently than I do because they're closer to the shop. But uh, there's a, a coffee uh, shop in Port Credit called Backroad Coffee Roasters. And so there's a little group that gets together every Friday in the morning. And so I went down one day and Andy and I had a long, long conversation on, uh, and, and it just kind of happened organically. I was just, we happened to be chatting and talk a little bit about uh, what Andy does for work and ended up getting into a, a very deep conversation about your your work. And it's fascinating work, the the stuff that you're working on right now, Andy. And so we thought it'd be a great opportunity to have you on the podcast and share what you're doing with everybody else and and provide a little bit of perspective. Because as Bill mentioned, I think this really does tie together a lot of different subjects that we've already covered on the podcast. You know, it, it covers the the web three and uh, blockchain technology topics that we talked that we touched upon with Skylar. It also <laughs> covers the building and home renovation space as well as uh, getting beyond just homes into industrial spaces as well. A topic which we covered with uh, with our friend Adam. And so Andy, why don't you uh, begin by just telling us a little bit about your career journey and how you founded your company Digital Inc. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Yeah, starting off, you can probably hear from my sort of hybrid accent. Originally born and raised Brisbane, Australia, and I had uh, I've always just had a passion for buildings, design. I used to draw lots of homes when I was a kid, you know, uh, roads, etc. So I've always had that passion, and then it just led me into. I'm actually, I'm actually, my my degree in education is in uh, Bachelor of Built Environment, must major majoring in industrial design which is actually product design of all out of interest. But then I've always, I always sort of wanted to be an architect. So I got straight into working for an architecture practice in Brisbane. And they were one of the, let's call them early adopters of this software. It was called a, it's called Autodesk Revit. And it's a building information modeling software. So um, which, which we'll, which we'll cover into today, no doubt at length, but yeah, I got into that. And you know what? It was just good timing. I, I, I loved it. It, it I, I learned it on the fly, on the job. And then I've just sort of rode this wave of that became, a, it became sort of an industry um, push, this this, uh, this way of working. 
in in the property and design area and um I, I worked my way through to another big practice and then i decided to make the move to uh, london uk that is where very fortunately building information modeling became an actual government mandate and that is where they basically in the uk said mm. For all specific types of government projects, it has to be carried out in this process using building information modeling. So it was right passion, right, right. time. Um, and then, yeah, I, I basically started implementing that and, and, and helping uh, architectural practices, multidisciplinaries implement this uh, way of working into practices. And then leading on to sort of a bit more recently, uh, it was back in uh, 2011, I, I joined a, a leading survey practice, a measured building survey practice, um, using some pretty cool technology, which we'll which we'll cover as well, like laser scanning, you know, three D data capture, and yeah, there was no, there was uh, then converting that into building information modeling format. It was a very new thing. So so I joined that company and then pioneered that sort of um, uh, that way of working, writing industry sort of leading specifications, etc. And then I decided to, I saw a bit of a gap in the market um, about there's a skill demand. There's not enough skill locally. I think I can join the dots like I did with this previous practice. So I started my own company called Digital Inc. And it was founded primarily based on being building information modeling at our core as the expertise, but also just connecting international skill sets and bringing that together to make much more efficient productivity, much faster and a more affordable approach so we can still deliver the exact deliverables, technology and skill set, but in a, um, in a global, with a global basically reach. So then, yeah, that, uh, and then that, that was, I spent 14 years in the UK. So that was about 2015. I started Digital Inc. And we saw just growing from there. And then, um, yes, why am I, I've then moved to Canada. Why is that? Well, I met my wife, Canadian. That's another whole story how we met. And then uh, as we spent spent a few years still uh, married and setting up a family in the UK and then moved here in 2021, right during COVID. Probably I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> Try to move country. <laughs> right. and yeah, and here we are today. Yes. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, and don't let me forget, Andy, I want to put a, uh, put a pin in that. Uh, you mentioned that it was a government mandate that this technology mm -hmm. was mandated for... Uh, uh, specific building projects. And I want to return to that and, and understand a little bit about why that was. But uh, in the meantime, tell us a little bit. So go into a little bit more detail about what your company Digital Link does exactly, because mm -hmm. it's uh, the service offerings are are incredible. And, and you kind of briefly touched upon it. But can you explain a little bit about the uh, how the company works for our audience? Sure. Yeah, sure. So so Digital Link, what we do is in a high level, we digitize buildings. Yep. Mm -hmm. So so what does digitizing buildings mean? It means taking anything that is property related. So it's land, buildings, infrastructure. Obviously, the, the, the categories of that are vast. You know, you can go from nuclear to, to roadways, to stadiums, to, to retail spaces, right? So anything mm -hmm. that is a built, the built environment, we can digitize. What is the digitization process? Well, it, there's, there's a few ways you can do it. The modern technology today will be using this process and designing and building using a digital process today. And that's what, that's what we call building information modeling. It's intelligent 3D modeling of buildings, if it's, right. it's a layman's way of explaining it. So, but what does Digital Link do with that? The vast majority of our work at the moment is, and this is the geomatic side of our business, that is the data capturing, it's the measurement so it's taking a, an already built uh, environment, a, a building, let's say, and typically what happens is the client, the owner will say, right, we need to re renovate, refurbish our, um, uh, our property. Therefore, will we need an accurate record of it? Traditionally, they would go and get a survey. Mm -hmm. Well, what we do in the, in the modern techniques today is will you go and capture that in 3D very rapidly using 3D laser, laser scanning and photogrammetry, et cetera. And then we basically reverse engineer the building. So we, we mm -hmm. convert the physical asset. We create a digital version of it. And it's not, right. just, it's not just CAD. It's not just objects 
in 3D space, it's an intelligent, it's, it's building components of the building and every component of that building knows what it is. Right. That's the intelligence of it. And that, and that is what we say, getting into a building information modeling environment. So that, that's what we do primarily. But so, like I said, but we're, we're working on, we're working on several different types of projects where it could be, do you know what? We don't even need a survey. We just want to digitize our current records. So it could be, we've got a whole database of drawings from the 1970s in PDF, old sheets, et cetera, blueprints, so to speak. Well, let's go and convert that. Let's create that into a, into a digital version. Mm-hmm. You don't even have to measure it yet. Yeah. Right. So historically, and I'll, this kind of ties into my next question, which is basically how exactly does the technology work? But if I understand you, what you're mm-hmm. saying, historically, if you were to go and try and recreate or plot out what an existing building looks like, somebody would have to go in and do physical measurements of everything within the space itself in order to recreate in a, in a digital environment, correct? And and what you're sure. using in terms of the laser technology cuts the mm-hmm. that measurement process down, I'm, I'm sure, astronomically so. Is totally. that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. So just to, just to um, elaborate on that. So yes, most people know traditional surveys. You're there with a total station looking through, grabbing points manually right. or with a laser distance, even tape measure, right? right? That's typically what you may see, especially for your home. You may see your builder running around or your architect with a tape measure, yeah. right? This takes it to a whole nother level where it's what a laser scanner does. Just to picture it like this, it's, it's a static point. It spins around 360 degrees and it's taking 2 million points per second. Is this so, like the Google truck that goes up and down streets? Kind of, John. Yeah, kind of. That's a bit, that's using more photogrammetry. That's photos, right? Mm-hmm. But this combines both. So as it's doing a 360 spin, doing a mm-hmm. million of those XYZ points per second, and this is millimeter accurate accuracy, it's, it then takes a 360 photo as well. So then what you what the resulting um, data you get, it's called a point cloud. And that's billions and billions of points, all to the millimeter accuracy. And it just looks like exactly what it says. It's a point cloud. And then we then translate that. We start slicing and dicing it and saying, right, that's a wall. That's 330 mil thick. Okay, that goes from here to this height, right? And we start reverse engineering, building the building like that. So it's super fast. Um, and that, I mean, that technology in that space is getting faster and faster as well. So you can now walk around. You can literally just be walking around a building and it is capturing that data as you walk. So it's getting, it's, it's, it's a really rapidly growing technology process there. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's hard to keep up with, right? <laughs> but, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's, it's rapidly fast. Yeah. Right. And, and so for the, for, for people who don't under, have a rudimentary understanding of the technology that you're using what is the difference between you know building information modeling and digital twinning because that's something that mm. i obviously i think a lot of people will confuse if they were to look at the service offerings that you guys have and think yeah isn't a digital twin exactly a, a bim a building information modeling or yeah and how does that how does that differ from traditional 3d modeling services and so i think you already kind of explained that mm-hmm. 3d modeling is basically just objects in space that have been digitally recreated. Obviously the building information modeling is a much more Mm -hmm. accurate and and nuanced picture that you've created a more detailed picture, but how does that differentiate from digital twinning? Yeah. Great question. And it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a gray area with a lot of marketing spiel around these words at the moment. So yeah, exactly like you said there, Alex, just 3d modeling is yeah. It's let's call it a, a a dumb, a dumb mass. It's, it's just a 3d object. The, you, the next step up is it's a building information modeling. So it's a 3D object, but it, it's intelligent. So it knows. So that mechanical, that mechanical, the air handling unit, it's, mm-hmm. it's modeled, it's geometrically accurate, and it has a whole bunch of data set within it. So it knows right. what it is. It knows its power consumption. It's connected to, um, it's got a warranty schedule. Everything that that needs to know is in mm-hmm. that piece of, um, let's call it a, an object times that over the rest of the building with lighting construction they all have their they all have their intelligent object that is called building information modeling so let's call that static that's static building information the next step is once you have that you can then take yourself to the next level which is digital twin now what a digital twin is is you're now starting to add live data to it so what does that mean? That means that air handling unit I just mentioned, 
it's now connected to it, it we can now start saying that air handling unit is pulling this much power pushing this much air it's running at this sort of efficiency we are now reading that and we know where it is in the model and we mm -hmm. know what it's currently doing so it's the live data right. that is what digital twin is so right. as, as you can then appreciate that's just one little aspect i mentioned imagine throwing so, everything at it yeah yeah so so basically we have added essentially smart sensors mm -hmm. in the building that are now communicating with the the bim model to create essentially a, a complete duplicate hence the name digital mm -hmm. twin mm -hmm. that is providing you with live to the second accurate information of what is going on in the environment the way uh, the way i was first introduced to the, that type of technology the iot internet of things was i used to work at a uh, an investment banking firm i interned there and it was during the craze when everybody when all the uh, cannabis companies were coming on board and so we uh, represented a lot of the cannabis companies that that uh, that were trying to raise capital and one of the things that a lot of the different because uh, essentially they're farmers it's agriculture what the one of the things that they were looking to do was implement iot technology to measure soil so they were looking to measure things like moisture and nutrients in the soil and provide and get live data feedback to say okay this is instead of having to go out and gather soil samples it was this is live accurate information right here that we can utilize and say okay turn on the sprinklers turn on the fertilizer, you know, whatever it is that you had to do in order to maximize your crop yield. And so this is taking that technology and it is integrating it into a, a physical structure and, and making it a live breathing entity, which is fascinating. Mm -hmm. So Andy, do you own this technology or is this something that's licensed from, uh, from another company? Yeah. So, so basically the technology is, let's call it, mm, let's call it like a, like an ecosystem. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a theory, let's call it, a theory that can mm -hmm. work. It's taking lots of parts, lots of already existing softwares, processes, and, um, and yeah, like we say, the Internet of Things. It's not as though you can just go buy. Can I please go buy the Internet of Things? No, it's, it's <laughs> something that you, that you build towards, right? Yes. So, so, for example, like I, I mentioned earlier, Autodesk Revit is, is, is a software that you would, is one of the main softwares that you will build a model in then it might be, okay, this, this company over here, this air handling unit system, this mechanical um, engineering company, they use this software for the data feed, right? right? Great, that's for them. Then we might have, there might be a people tracking software, mm -hmm. which we know of as well, that, pe that tracks people in your, in your property. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a unique software device as well. What right. Digital Twin does, it bridges all that together. So, you know, the building information mod model, think of that as just one of the data sources. It's the static information. And what comes with that is it knows then how many square foot of glass you have, what its U values, R values are, what, what volume of space you have. Then you throw in weather. Weather is a, weather is a software system as well, right? Let's throw, that, right? let's throw that in. And what we're doing is we're connecting it all together. So no, we don't own it. We haven't, you know, there's nothing that we proprietary own that's so unique here. Mm -hmm. Watch this space. It is something we're looking at building in the future. That's yeah. something we, we, we do want to sort of collab, bring all that together into a smart dashboard. But no, it, it is it is just, it's joining parts. We're like a shop. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, Andy, I'm the uh, oldest one here. So I, um, I want you to dumb it down for me and, and for other people who don't fully comprehend all this technology. What is a practical application? Pretend this was a house and not on a commercial property. Give an example of, of what this means to the homeowner if you integrate this technology for them. Sure. So, so as a homeowner in the residential market, as you can appreciate, there's, there's, it's an iterative uh, benefit. So I'm going to wind back to, right, you've got your house sitting there today. I'm going to, you might say, okay, get my house digital. Or we might even say more realistic approaches. I'm about to do a renovation to my house. Yep, I want to do something to it. Okay, let's go and get a laser scan survey. We've got now accurate representation, more accurate than you would have had with a traditional survey. What that means is you are now, your architects and engineers are going to be able to renovate and or design, so, sorry, design your uh, house and refurbish it much more accurately and they're going to coordinate it much better because as we as we know in the industry and for any listener out there that may not know this but the construction industry is very siloed at the moment it's very like the structural engineer they work on their part the mechanical works over here 
And occasionally they get together and overlay their drawings and see if it works or not. This technology, this process brings them more, it brings them closer together in a fluid way. So the industry is winning today with just simple clash detection. So you're digitally building your house first, which means when you get to site, 99.99% of your build will be accurate and won't have any clashes and changes. And that's where you can get caught out, right? With building. Oops, sorry, we didn't realize this pipe hit that beam. Okay, we now we now can mitigate that and etc. So that's your first win. So you get a better design and coordination. Then once you've gone through construction, you're now you've now got this digital record, this digital, let's call it digital twin ready of your house. I can now start putting because it's now digital. And we all know software, computer power. I'm not even, I, I, I will mention think now AI, throw that into the mix. Wow. Imagine what we can start doing to optimize our house for performance. So I now know can connect, right? How much power am I generating per minute per day? Where's my, where's the solar? Where's the, the weather coming in? Where it, when's, where's the sun hitting these windows, warming up this space? Okay, maybe I can, optimize or the computer will tell you this can optimize how much air conditioning or heating we need in that space compared to somewhere else so you see my point here that you're starting to so in the operation of your house you're 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 finding performance improvements which to the average homeowner yeah okay maybe maybe you're saving a few cents per hour etc but you you scale this up to commercial to multiple properties especially when you're dealing with large properties that have you know, you're fine tuning your your PLs and your operational costs. It's huge. Some of the stats we've seen from research, you're sort of saving. You can sort of say save ten percent from traditional in the building and uh, design phase. The design phase, you can save about twenty percent in the construction phase due to those clash detection issues I mentioned. And what they're seeing is probably a thirty five percent saving in operational costs which is the majority of the cost of a building, right? Over 25, yes. 30 year life cycle. Yeah, the, yeah exactly. And, and that's where we're getting into the the life, the lifespan of the building itself. And that's obviously where the big dollars are going to add up over an extended period of time. Correct. So when it comes to utilization of this technology, where do you, where does your firm sit? Are you an intermediary between the property owner and the, the architect? Is that uh, the, the correct way to picture you in, in this situation? Yes, typically, typically, um, the in our day-to-day business yeah we typically will work directly for the client like the property owner they'll engage us to say yes we need x done can you please go and do it and then deliver that deliverable to the design team the architect engineers etc sometimes we'll have the architect come to us because they need they need to go out and get quotes and acquire this service but we fundamentally everything i'm talking to you today about it's the client it's the end owner operator who benefits Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That, that's, Who benefits? That's really, so, yeah. so you, but that's what I mean. Though, like you interact with both of them, so you are basically you're providing them. You sell the service to them. You then mm-hmm. work with the architect, and so that's why I kind of picture it as the 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 midpoint between those two. Yes. So, you mentioned Andy that you guys obviously have operations in both Canada and the United States. Mm-hmm. How prevalent is this technology across the two geographies? And I, I have a, an idea based on what you said earlier, and I think this might be a good point to uh, touch upon why the UK government pushed for this adoption at the uh, at the government level when it came to building uh, projects. So why don't you just talk a little bit about the two different geographies, how they differ, how they're the same in terms of adoption and just uh, where it all stemmed from? Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting one. Uh, do you know what? I, I couldn't confidently tell you what actually made the government go, yeah, let's do this. I couldn't confidently say that to you. However, I can I can hypothesize and say, luckily, because the construction industry is so slow, so slow moving, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. It is it is the biggest in the UK, biggest industry. It's very slow moving. Just luckily, I would say that the right person at the right time in government mandated it and pushed for it, right? Someone who's a bit more pioneering. But what they're saying, they they see the research and they say, well, Government likes to save money, right? They're, they're, mm-hmm. They they watch their they watch their pennies, and then and so they just they just implemented it, but it was a bit loose. So it was a bit of a period there where you had technical people like me and passionate pioneers going, "Yeah, let's do it." You know, let's let's create these let's create these uh, shall we say 
workshops and um, and these groups, steering groups, right, to, to really push it. So that helped. But what happened is the private side, the private um, owners and, such, and developers, et cetera, they were more, some savvy ones were like, yes, of course, this makes sense. It, it, it looks like it will save us all this money like you're, like you're showing. But as you can imagine, when you have, when you're trying to get something off the ground, you've got people that don't, weren't really grasping it naturally against it. You can imagine it didn't take off as, as fast as you'd think it would. Mm-hmm. But why the, why the UK, why Europe, why is this? Well, they are primarily, as you know, there's not a huge amount of land there. Everything's old and they, it, refurbishment is, is, is daily there. Everyone has to refurbish their mm-hmm. or renovate their buildings. Less so here. It's a lot more just new build because it's, you know, Canada, Australia, et cetera. It's still yes. the new world. Same with the US. So, so that's why I was talking about the, the concept of this laser scanning. That's why that technology just, just has been embraced because how do you go and measure existing old buildings and develop them faster, more efficiently? So that's why that right. technology there boomed. Building information modeling itself it's just naturally boomed because it's, it's, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Why is Canada behind, um, and it's several years behind, I'm, I've been giving the sort of lunch and learns, educational journeys, actually, to mm-hmm. some of our clients. And and we're talking, but I won't name names, because, but we're talking to some big players, and they're still still learning about that. Oh, okay, is this what BIM is? So it's still, still behind here a bit. And I just think because the government hasn't pushed it as much, there's been no force. To, right. to do it right which is interesting because you know you look at the uh obviously any sort of anybody who lives in uh the civilized world can attest anytime the government gets involved in a construction project it's not a fast project and it's generally not a cheap one mm-hmm. and so you can see the obvious application but hopefully that the understanding that this will lead to long-term savings will be a great benefit and a great boon and mm-hmm. and, and see further adoption within uh within the building industry here in canada so uh I'll turn it over to you, Dad, so we can talk a little bit about uh, industrial applications of the technology. Well, uh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm still, I still need a more uh, an explanation of what this means to the average person. Okay, so you have this Internet of Things, which allows the building, uh, so one one segment of the building to speak to another segment of the building. Can you capture that for the lay person? How that works? So you're saying. The mm-hmm. building without you intervening will say lights out on the 13th floor in uh, in the closet. What yes. happens? Yeah. So so basically because it's connected, because it's connected to, you know, mm-hmm. I, I am now like let's let's take like, take your house today. You don't know if that lights out. You have to go and turn it on, right? You go, right. oh, the light's blowing. Got a right. great I've got a great example. Uh we were with a very we were talking to a very large hospital here, and a good anecdote he said was he spent half the day walking around his campus trying to find a light bulb <laughs> right, that fit oh, wow. a certain um, certain fitting. So that's half a day of a facility manager walking around trying to find one light bulb. Now, that's just one, just one example, right? Imagine the, the time and cost of that. Now, if you've got everything digitally recorded and it's connected so already something's going to flag up on your dashboard let's say let's say you're sitting there the facility manager's got this u-butte software and it goes alarm going off dee, dee, dee. this light bulb has turned off it's not working anymore to, and, and I'm, I'm going to paint you a picture of what this would look like that is going to automatically it's going to flag that and it will automatically go right the, the, the software knows the manufacturer. It knows where to get it from. And I mean, we'll get into this in a second when you start looking at the blockchain and Web3 thing, but it, it could automatically purchase it, deliver it to your door. Do you know what all the facility manager has to then do is look at that and go, I've now got to physically replace it. That is my responsibility of managing that. So maybe where is that light bulb? Oh, it's actually up high in a, in a two-story void uh, uh, sorry, you know, uh, yeah, like storage warehouse yeah. of, of some sort. Yeah, exactly. Where you need safe access. Oh, I need to get yeah. a hoist in there, etc. Okay, what what else does that mean? I've got to get safe access. I've got to do this. Okay, well, do you know what? All of those light bulbs look like they might be coming to the end of their life. Let's do them all at once. 
right? So I'm only shutting down a space for a short period of time and I'm doing them all today, right? I'm not having to walk, spend half my day trying to look for a light bulb, even if I have it. And then I'm not just, I, I haven't had to wait for someone to tell me that light bulb was out, right? Because how many users are going in there just ignoring it? I mean, look, I'm, I'm picking on, I'm picking on one little light bulb here, which is a nice little um, simple, simple analogy. But as you can imagine that expanding that over your whole A building and portfolio, et cetera, I'm going to take it one step further. That's the facility manager there having to go and arrange all this. Imagine a system, and this is, this is true today, that then sends all of this information. It goes and orders the light bulb. It gets it sent. It will tell you when it's going to be delivered to your, um, to your office. Then it automatically sends out to your contractor a, a change order, like an order to say, you need to come and change this light bulb. It then sends it to the contractor. They get it on their phone. It shows them the route they have to go down the building to find that light bulb. It may even give them an electronic key, right? Because if all of your keys are electronic, that just accesses the doors that person needs, right? Makes them sign all, digitally sign all the health and safety regulations, fills all the forms. So you can see the swiftness this is doing, right? And the time savings this is having. And that's just for one light bulb. Yeah. It traditionally took someone half a day to run around and try and find it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and so, yeah. Imagine a bigger industrial application, like a, a manufacturing complex where you'd, if you might have to shut down your entire process. You know, I, I think of something, something as simple as uh, there, there's a refinery here that's over, uh, that, that's close to where we live in Mississauga. And it's a big, huge building owned by Petro Canada. And as you can imagine, it's built with millions of intricate pipes and wiring and, and whatnot. And to try and go and isolate certain issues or, or certain uh, uh, faulty spots in the in the manufacturing process might take, forget half a day, it might take a week, it might take a couple mm-hmm. weeks, depending on uh, on how difficult it is to find, as well as the fact that you might have to shut down production that time. So it's not only the the time, it's also the cost of shutting down your production. And so that's where having smart mm-hmm. technology in there would save time and save money. And provide real value to the the property manager and the and potentially the uh, the owner of the business. It's so really it's, it's, yeah. it, so it's it's not just light bulbs. This is every oh, yeah. working device in the in the building. Anything that you can have connected to, as we you know we use the term Internet of Things. So anything that can you can read its function. Like what is it doing? As long as you can read that information. You can control it, however. So, so, so HVAC, a compressor, mm-hmm. some pump, mm-hmm. something breaks down. Yep. So no one has to visually see it. It, yep. it is sensed by mm-hmm. the system, mm-hmm. puts it on the dashboard, and the facility manager uh, yep. is alerted to it. But then everything speaks to each other, takes mm-hmm. care of it. Yeah. Pretty much, that's 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 the very near, if not today, very near future of we will start seeing that application. We could build that today. Like we could build that system like I've just described to you today. Is there something that you can just say, I'd like to buy that, please? Well, no, there's no no one's built an actual plug and play for that today yet, <clears throat> but, but, but we can build it, like connecting systems like I explained earlier. Andy, tell us about your recent project at the Rogers Center and the Blue Jays. Sure. So yeah, that, that's a that's a good example of of basically what we did there was as 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 any probably Ontarian will know, <laughs> the the Rogers Centre Blue Jays has uh, recently been going undergoing uh, renovations. So they came to us a couple of years ago to say, All right, we have got a plan for this stuff. We need these areas captured, modelled so we can successfully plan and, and, and renovate. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the beauty of this laser scanning I was telling you about is you pick the right time. Obviously, it had to be when um, the season's over. They could strategically, like here's, here's a great example a lot of people ask in our industry. How do I see above ceiling tiles? It's all hidden. It's hidden. There's a whole maze of important parts of a building that are hidden by architectural fit out ceilings etc so it's, it's a really good one to um, consider so what we what we did there was you only had to remove every certain number of ceiling tiles we run through scan those areas you know sometimes you might put put the put the scanner up above the ceiling etc 
And what we're able to do is very fast, very efficiently. And when I say one visit, this is over obviously several nights, several weeks, you know, where this thing can't, it's not, it's not as fast as you can run. So it's, you know, but in one session, we have done an unobtrusive, low, low impact data capture where we captured everything that needed to be captured of, for the renovations. We then converted that into a building information modeling ready uh, data set, which is a 3D model and uh, in, in, in enough intelligence as, as needed. For then, the architects and engineers would take that and they can then start saying, great, we've now got this. We can now start designing, planning, um, and coordinating with that information. The beauty of this as well is when we take that, that survey that we've done, the site work, you're also handing over to the design team, all stakeholders, et cetera, mm -hmm. that virtual tour. So they can now run around that building using photography. Like it's, it's almost like you said earlier, John, it's like Google Street View, right? You're running right. around Google Street View in the building. And because you're looking at accurate millimeter, you know, millimeter accurate data, you can start clicking on those photos mm -hmm. and getting accurate dimensions just from this, just from on your desktop. So you can imagine the site time that uh, the, the visits you don't have to do, the coordination meetings you can have, and you don't actually have to be there on site. So if a project would normally there. take three months, how much time does this save? Well, to do, do you know what? To capture what we did traditionally, ooh, I, would, I wouldn't even know how long that would take. Like, it would be so long. But this took us, this took us, let's call it two to three weeks of data capture time. It had to be sort of after hours. It was a bit, a bit sort of right. um, a bit right. bitty because of that. Um, nothing's ever just straight through, fly through as fast as you can. So um, it took you three weeks, but uh, without this technology, it would have taken how long? Oh, geez, I couldn't even answer that, John. I, <laughs> I don't because six yeah, six months. Oh, if that, like way more. I, I would way say, more. Yeah. So you're talking about well, maybe you're taking a year's worth of normal work, compressing yeah. it to three weeks. Call it a month. Cool yeah. So, so the cost savings to the organization is huge. It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. I don't think it, they could have even done this traditionally, John. That, that's that's how that's how extreme it is. From the data that we captured, and right. the information that we were able to produce, I I'd struggle to I struggle to see how they could do that within yeah. Let's call it within six months. Absolutely not. Yeah. That's what I was just about to say. Is is mm. what's what makes this technology so incredible and so valuable mm. is the fact that it it can make the project like this possible and in in the past if there was ever an issue with the physical building like usually maple leaf gardens as an example the the amount of intricate detail that was utilized and, and we're talking about blueprints from the 1930s mm -hmm. it's somebody to physically go through and measure everything in order to do a retrofit of the building in order to make it modernized and and add amenities to it and, and make modifications to the physical structure would take so much time that it, it wouldn't be possible to do it in an off season they're trying to compress this work to a you know, they're doing it over three off seasons, obviously, where they're doing several phases of the work. But in order to even complete one single phase within an off season is a monumental task. And so mm -hmm. this technology providing that ability to capture that information quickly. Mm -hmm. So then you can go in and do the physical construction part and you can do it in an efficient manner where there's less back and forth, less changes and modifications that need to be made to the original plans as they're being implemented by the various contractors mm -hmm. makes this project actually possible and the first one i can actually remember utilizing something like this was madison square garden in new york where they did a retrofit of a, a building that is essentially at this point i believe 80 odd years old actually probably even more than that now and, and so to be able to do that as opposed to building a brand new physical structure is a, a huge cost savings and a huge time savings for the organization so so andy when you went to the rogers center and you did this how many people are involved, you know, your team? How, how many people are involved for that project? Like, say, five, 30, uh, and, and they just walk around and they're capturing things digitally using the, the devices. So give us an, a sense of... Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a really good question, John. And that was all done with one person and a scanner. You're now, kidding. Yeah. Now, we can do, you can do faster. You can throw three people in a, three people, three scanners on that. You, you, you're speeding it up. That was only because at the time, our team only had one scanner. <laughs> right? So, so right. right. So you can go faster. You can go faster. Um, really? 
Yeah, there, there so, is. So, so what the simple the simplification is incredible because mm-hmm. I'm imagining 30 guys with hard hats and mm-hmm. funky equipment and they're going in there and measuring stuff. And you're telling me one guy went in there with a scanner and in the span of three weeks got all the information required to do this twinning of the building. Totally. Yep. Wow. That's, that is it in a, in a nice high level summary for sure. And, and so just so, just so you know, as a, as a ballpark, if everyone, if anyone sort of has a concept of square meterage, et cetera, you can capture between 1500 to 3000 square meters a day of, or, you know, that, that there's a lot of variables with that, but that's how fast this data capture. So Andy, once we get past the construction and renovation phase, mm-hmm. Are there other ways this technology can be utilized? I'm thinking along the lines of measuring retail traffic flows or in assisting mm-hmm. building maintenance with identifying issues. So are you, are you meaning as in when it, when we once the once the job's done and, yeah. and we're using yeah. the, the digital the digital asset of it? That's yes. right. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's and that's when you got to start looking at implementing. So soft. So there's two there's two angles here. You've got the the digital twin side, which you're monitoring traffic flow. So that's that's connecting monitoring systems. So there there is technology out there today that will sit there using cameras, um, Wi-Fi technology, etc. It's pretty it's pretty cool stuff what you can do, but it can actually identify a unique individual. Obviously, there's a big thing about privacy, which which they have solutions for. But it will track individual people on their traffic flow going in from this. They came in from this door. They left here. They spent this amount of time there. So once so, that information of traffic flow is captured, how does that help the organization? So, well, that's, you know, and this is you're starting to get the realms of uh, my expertise runs out because I'm here handing over. Well, once you've got data, once you have this data, this is intelligent data that's very important because what is it that most buildings are trying to serve? Most buildings, they're trying to accommodate people and they're trying to accommodate either is it their spending or their enjoyment. Right, they want them to spend more time here. They want them to come back, and they want to enjoy mm-hmm. this space. Then you've got um, the whole governance section as well. You've you've got rules and regulations about your traffic flow. How do you know? Am I over occupied at the moment? Have I got too many people going into that lift? Is that floor now unsafe? Have I broken a, a, a legisl- you know, a, a regulation, etc.? That's where that type of helps as well. So then, you then, could even theoretically, Andy, sorry to interrupt, is you could take the information once you have that information, once you create the digital twin, because mm-hmm. essentially what you're doing is you're creating, it, it, like you said, you're building data. And once you mm-hmm. have that data, you have infinite possibilities. So you could take mm-hmm. the data and you could say, okay, we have too many people who are using this bathroom. For whatever reason, this bathroom seems to be a popular one. That means we need to install more bathrooms along the way in order to alleviate some of the demand on that one. Or we have a garbage overflow over here well that's because it's two there there's only one garbage can in this facility or in this vicinity and therefore people are you know getting so far and just throwing their stuff on the ground uh you know when it comes to retail space you could even use it in the from the sense that okay i see people are moving around they seem to get to this part of the store and then turn around and leave well why is that is that because that's where all of our popular products are do we need to maybe shift some of our popular products to the back to ensure that people make the full journey through the store like this is the the application of the technology is is mm-hmm. limitless in terms of how you can utilize it once it's in place once you build the digital twin. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah you've you've nailed it, and 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 yeah, that's the tip of the iceberg, right? So, but then you join. This is where digital twin Internet of Things come in. Once you join that data, so now I know I can now visually map like a heat map. I can see where people have gone. Wow, look at that. Now let's add in weather, air conditioning, power generation. What's happening there? Okay, mm-hmm. oh look at that. My my people were not going there probably because it was too hot. It was too cold. Oh, look, you know, the, the most amazing stats could come out. Why is right. it that people weren't doing this? Oh, because they, they, why is it when it's raining? Because they've got an umbrella. Like, you know, you've heard about these funny stories, right? Like, yeah. uh, oh, what is it? It's, it's these um, intricate, tiny things. And that's why data analysts today are paid so much. They're worth right. so much, right? Because all you have to do is just grab data connect it with other data and it's limitless. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, that's why, that's why I sort of, I, I stopped short of trying to explain where you could go with it because it's, it, it's, it's mega. You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like you, you have limitless possibilities in terms of the application of the data once you're able to mm-hmm. capture it. But uh, mm-hmm. even to your point, 
in terms of something like air conditioning and airflow and uh, and internal internal heating, you you can get into a situation where you're you're heating or you're cooling a space unnecessarily because nobody's occupying it. So you could be saving money, or conversely, exactly. you could be heating or cooling more efficiently, like you said. To uh, it's a problem that we often uh, incur in our house. You know, you get one part of the house that's too hot, one part of the house that's too cold, and you know you're if you had something like this where you had smart technology that was able to detect, okay, we have cold uh, one room up here that is occupied, but is very cold. You can direct heat into that room specifically, but not still heat up the other rooms, which are already at the desired temperature. Mm -hmm. Like you could start creating smart technology to funnel that, uh, that heat only to the areas that are needed. And we're talking Uh, about, and we're talking, sorry, Alex, about reactive. This is reactive. We're talking about what about predictive? Throw predictive. Correct. So once you've spent a year, I'm gonna I'm just gonna give an arbitrary arbitrary time. You spend a year collecting this data. A year is a good cycle, mm-hmm. right? You go, okay, next year, do you know what? January the 15th, last year, this happened. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm now gonna tune and look, it looks like all the same parameters are happening. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna already go ahead and do that, do that that scenario. And like I said earlier, throw AI into the mix. Imagine, imagine, imagine with an AI overseeing this. Mm-hmm. It's it's doing the data for you, and it's going okay. Yes. Well, based on a bunch of regulations you've given me, and, mm-hmm. and for anyone out there who you know is still is still on that AI <laughs> journey, it's basically AI is is taking you give it a bunch of parameters, a set piece of rule, and it will work with those rules and apply it to whatever you inputs you you give it. So right. imagine what you can do with that, right? right. And and it, and it, it it almost is. Wow, sit back and watch my building just sing, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know. Like you, I think you and I, when we talked, we we talked about the example of a, 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 an office building, but there's two different entrances. One, uh, and you know, mm-hmm. downtown Toronto is famous for this. You know, you have the underground path, which mm-hmm. a lot of people take, especially in the winter time, but mm-hmm. it is less common in the summer months because people want to be outside and they enjoy it. Mm-hmm. So they're going to use the entrances which come from street level in the summer mm-hmm. and they're going to use the underground uh, path entrances during the winter time and so you can allocate your your resources whether it comes to heating electricity lighting whatnot in order to like you said adapt say okay i know that today on this day it's gonna it's more likely to rain therefore more people are likely to come from underground so we're gonna yeah. maybe turn up the heaters a little bit on the underground heating system make sure the lights are on down there maybe turn them off at the street level because there's not really a need for them at that point and Mm-hmm. and be adaptive mm-hmm. in that way so mm-hmm. imagine anyway, then selling this imagine then selling this data because i mean we're talking about building operations right mm-hmm. which is it is it's the winning for the um winning for the building owner but imagine then you can start selling that information i'm not going to say selling it you're giving that information to potential retail money making aspects advertising right? right um and performance so you're then going to say hey by the way um client of ours is in tenant or mm-hmm. someone looking to, uh, you want to sell your product here, et cetera. I can give you all these performance matrix and maybe you want to go and um, tweak your marketing campaign around these performance matrix. Do you want to sit yes. here? Look at that. You get this amount of X, X amount of traffic coming in. This is how they're thinking right. and behaving. It's pretty powerful right. stuff. Pretty, and it is. Trying to say, put a monetary value to it. Okay, that's going to rock it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we, we've talked about the industrial and we, we did touch a little bit upon the, the residential aspect of it, Andy, but we're going to drill in a little bit more detail here. So when it comes to residential construction and development, you know, how can this technology be applied at the at, at the individual level? So we're I, I assume that we would you know have all the same capabilities in terms of measurement and in terms of mm-hmm. saving time and, and, and effort when it comes to contractors and and various specialties but how else is that how else can value be derived for the homeowner when it comes Mm. to utilizing this technology sure so let's let's yes you're saying let's bring it back to the yeah the the individual people yeah Yeah, Yeah. we own a home how can i how can i make my home perform better so we're already seeing it i think across the board in in many aspects actually i haven't seen it here yet in canada but in the uk a lot of energy energy providers can give you a little device and it actually monitors your your power, right? What's happening. Right. Um, but, I, you know, we mentioned digital twin. We mentioned all this U-Butte technology and people go, oh, wow, this sounds all great, but, you know, over my head. It's actually not because I can tell you right now, even just you having an, your Ecobee, for example, or your Nest, mm-hmm. if it, and today you can already connect it, you can connect your Ecobee with a door opener, right? Right. That's a digital twin. 
right there. Right. That's a digital twin system because it's taking it actually, and it understands weather as well. So right. it's saying, it's telling it to say, if that it senses that door's open, I'm going to mm -hmm. turn off the air conditioning for a bit. Okay, right. you've got a, you've got a two way two way signal. Right. So so that happens already today, and it's like going, okay, great. But now you start if if as like we said, how does this how does this enhance the homeowner? Well, operationally, you can then you can then expand that further, right? You then plug mm -hmm. a three D model into that, and it starts going, okay, I now know my volume, I now know my R values of of my walls, my my windows, etc. Mm -hmm. what, what's an to, r value andy sorry to interrupt uh, what's, that's a, what's the, an a, a r value yeah that's it's the same it's, it's different in the straight as well it's called u values it's basically your um heat heat gain heat thermal so it's like like how good the insulation is correct yeah it's your thermal thermal sort of calculation in layman's terms yeah so so it's basically saying that wall with that sort of um insulation or that window is graded so it's got a value to it Mm -hmm. So if you start understanding that, plug that into the to the system, your perhaps you could then make it read HVAC and your your air conditioning, et cetera, to to, to optimize it for that. Right? right. So like I said earlier, for operations, yeah, you could save and look, everyone's spending a lot of money at the moment and trying to trying to save money on on energy, as we know. So if anyone will be happy to see, oh, if I can save cent. So so out. theoretically, if I have a, a, a house with four rooms upstairs. The system can sense that this room is not being utilized. There's no people in there. I can drop the temperature in there by two degrees, mm -hmm. reallocate that heat to the room where people are occupying it and if they need heat, mm -hmm. and then adjust automatically. Am I getting that correctly? Correct. Absolutely. But yeah. also know based on traffic patterns that if you're if you are more likely to go to bed at nine o'clock than at eight forty-five it would start heating that room in anticipation of you going up there because that's your normal routine. That's your normal pattern. So it would take traffic flows and, and patterns and data and be able to provide smart insights in order to benefit the experience that, of the homeowner. That's exactly right. And if there's any, oh. if there's any mechanical engineers out there listening to this and go, Whoa, hold on. That's you got to have a special system <laughs> to install for that. But even, even if it's just a case of having little electronic vent, Vent openers, rather right? just yeah. adjust, just adjust the vent openers. That, that's as simple as that. I I want to yeah. know who goes to bed at nine o'clock. Yeah. Oh. I try. <laughs> just using a, a theoretical <laughs> example: people who don't have anything else to do with their life <laughs> yeah. uh, go to bed at nine o'clock. People with young but, children uh, go to bed early. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I, I wouldn't say that, that. that answers your um, sort of scenario there. It it it's yeah. basically to the homeowner. And I sorry, and and obviously design and build as well. And I, I've got a, I've got a very brief anecdote here. We, we, we recently went through renovations on our house. And of course, I went and laser scanned it. I did it all in BIM. I did it myself. And we've got a good anecdote where the, um, just the measurement showed a wall slightly on an angle, slightly on an angle. But the architect went and squared it off for the drawings, right? And I just thought, okay, you know, maybe, maybe it's an architect, Bricky's thumb, as they say. But you know what happened? Because our builder went and then did modular off-site off manufacturing, which is then able to say, mm -hmm. build all the floors, build all the walls. It went up super rapid. But what they found is like, geez, we're six inches out somewhere and it, we've got some issue. Do you know what it came down to? What? That, that wall. The measurement of the wall. Measurement of the wall. Oh. I, was, I, was so, I was so infuriated because I, oh, why didn't I flag it? I saw it. I, I, I saw the, the, the angle. It's very slight. You wouldn't catch it to the, to the naked eye. But just because of that, yeah, it, 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 look, it wasn't it wasn't a major issue at the end of the day. We actually gained a few more inches here and there. But that's just one little example of a small renovation of how it could make or break your budget there when you're mm -hmm. trying to go and more things. And and just so everyone knows, you know, off-site manufacturing is becoming more and more modular, right? So getting yes. something built in a factory shipped to your house, yeah, yeah. So it, it makes the the process faster and more seamless. So if you're able to manufacture stuff on site, instead of having to manufacture it, bring it on uh, on site, then con construct it and assemble it there and, and put it in, that obviously has time constraints associated with it. And mm -hmm. like you said, if you have even minor differences in the measurements that could lead to additional time and cost and back and forth adjustments in order to accommodate for those uh, mistakes. Mm -hmm. Another example that I thought of was something if you were to, uh, you know, one of the most destructive things in a home is water. And mm -hmm. if you were able to sense in advance that, you know, there is a, a structural 
uh, the, the structural integrity of a, a particular piece of either lining or material is starting to be compromised, whether that be a pipe or whether that be, you know, the lining in a bathroom uh, underneath a shower. If you were able to have that information available to you, you could proactively go in and say, okay, I know that it is starting to degrade. We need to change mm -hmm. this pipe or we need to change this liner before it develops a leak. And before this costs me incrementally more money, because not only am I now repairing uh, or replacing that item, but I also have to undergo the cost of re the repairs that it, uh, for the damage that it uh, it caused as well. So, so, so is that, is obviously... that possible, Andy? Is that possible that like he can sense when a pipe is weak and 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 send you a message so he can do what Alexander is describing? I, I I believe so. I'm not I'm not a um I'm not a fluids dynamics person or a, a, a plumbing expert. However, yes, you put a sensor you put a sensor on its flow. And it's something we didn't touch on. It, it, it piqued my re reminder earlier. Is yes, we like we said we're talking about reactive analysis. Predictive analysis is where if you've got sensors on flow, right on 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 um on the plumbing, it's sensing how much pressure's in there. If it senses a change that's out of anomaly, right, flag something. And it's probably, it, you know, again, like I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a plumbing expert and fluids dynamic person, but you could, I'm sure there's a formula that goes, ah, right. that change means X. Right. Yes. You need to do something. You've got two yeah. months before that thing's going to yeah. pop. That, yeah. That's incredible. Right. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And obviously as anybody can imagine, uh, aside from the insurance companies would probably be upset about it. Actually, the insurance companies wouldn't, they never want to pay out. They just want to collect your premiums. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> I was going to say they might not be happy about that technology being implemented. That's it. <laughs> but sorry, and sorry, and you know what? Just just elaborating. You can probably the... get an insurance savings if they know you have this technology implemented. Correct, totally. Yes. And I was going to say that as well. You know, we're talking about digital twins and all this information, uh, inf Internet of Things. Imagine then what you can start do. I, I forgot to mention as well that this then leads on to smart cities. So you have imagine if imagine if every building was a digital twin. You've then got a smart city. I'm sure that when this starts to take off, the government, the council, will give you credit, right? Because you're giving them information as well. You're saying, hey, I'm giving you live information of how we're operating our home. Then I go, okay, yeah, you're running pretty green. Like you are really, and you're doing everything you possibly can to reduce your emissions for sustainability. And we can see that information. We don't just have to trust you or come and read your meter, right? I'm sure they will give you tax credits, benefits, incentives, right? Because you're giving, you know, you're, you're, A, you're just giving them information, et cetera. But that does segue onto this whole Web3 thing as well. Yes. <laughs> so before before we get into that, Andy, I just quickly wanted to ask you one last question before we move into the the blockchain applications of, and future development. And that was, you know, is it easier to implement and utilize this technology when constructing new buildings? Or is the application just as valuable or more so in an existing building? Both. The only difference is when you're doing a new build is you take away that need for that 3D reverse uh, scanning and reverse right. engineering, right? You're building right. from 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 ground zero, from spec. right? Everything's built. But other than that, no, there's no there's no real difference. Like I said, it's just that first phase of having to reverse engineer, having to guess what that wall was, um, having to take down that ceiling to then read a code. Oh, that's that pipe. It's taking that out because you're putting everything new in. That's that's the major difference. Yeah. So okay, so, perfect. Go ahead, Ed. Yeah, yeah. So the um, we had Skyler on uh, in a previous podcast talking about blockchain technology. Mm. Can you elaborate a little more on how this technology that you're dealing with ties into the use of blockchain technology and and cryptocurrency? Yeah, this is uh, it's a big, big topic. So, like okay, I said, okay, let's uh, dumb it. Let's dumb it down for people like me, and oh. and 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 give us a simple explanation. Oh, I'll, I'll caveat. I'm already speaking the dumbed down version because I'm still. <laughs> my eyes have been opened up to this only recently as well. Just that the, the 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 data we're sitting on and 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 what this means. So, so as far as I'm concerned, what I'm truly excited about is like we mentioned earlier. You are now connecting data, right? You are now your. Let's say, let's say we followed followed this vision of we've been um, broadcasting here today. Okay, great, Andy. I've got this. I've got 
let's let's look at Rogers Stadium for example. Let's say they go great. We've now got our stadium all up and running. It's full digital twin. I've got sensors connected everywhere. I'm monitoring people. Yep. They are. You are now becoming a live data gatherer, just like why is Instagram um, so valuable? LinkedIn, Facebook, all these guys, right? Because it's a data gathering. Um, that's what you're. That's what you're. You're giving them data. That's just on spending habits. So there's a monetary value to that. This, in in an immediate effect goes, right, you can now sell this data, right? Because you're gathering it. I'm sure you can anonymize, et cetera. Because because the data we're gathering about that particular building is going to be valuable to someone else who's designing a building or wants to optimize their building. Or what are you doing? Okay, that's that's really important information. Maybe for the retail and marketing space as well. Look at that. People steam, look at that trend that when people, X happens over here, People do this within a building, right? People spend over here. You connect it to the to the the transactions, and this is where Skylar's got a much more um, eloquent way of putting things like this. But you you can now start joining the dots between spending, transactions, how you you know influences, and this is all data that is worth something. So that's one aspect. So it's the, it's the data value that you're gathering. Secondly, I see this as the tokenization, or I think you call it the securitization, right? The secur- mm-hmm. securitization. So this is where you can now say, and this is where the Web3 advancement comes in and putting things on the blockchain. This is what, And this is what really excited me. I'm thinking, wow, you can now um, put this to market on a global scale. You can now say, I am going to tokenize my asset that I run. And that's what's mm-hmm. exciting because you... And, I think I think Skylar covered this quite well previously, but anything that can be put on the blockchain is digitized. I mean, I, I read somewhere recently that they're digital twinning gold, right? Rather than having to have to have the physical asset, so you can now you can now um, buy pieces of property or or diversify. You know, you can start doing that with your assets. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm excited about, and that's and that's what I think what the yeah. The long-term goal is and what should be really interesting for these property and asset managers and owners. Yeah, so, so what we talked about, Dad, in, in the previous episode with Skylar was, you know, the idea of being able to securitize or, or monetize mm-hmm. the a portion of your equity if you needed to. So let's say that you you owned your home outright, but you needed some cash flow for mm-hmm. whatever it was, renovations and anything, unexpected, unexpected expenditures. And you want to go out and you want to sell or liquidate a portion of your home, you have a live piece of information instead of just like a company would provide their balance sheet and cash flow statement. You are basically providing the balance sheet and cash flow statement in digital version to your potential investors for them to see, you know, this is a, they, they're comfortable buying a portion of this property. And then, you know, at the future, if you wanted to buy that back, you can go and you can buy those shares or those tokens so, back out on the open market. So, so, so this technology that Andy, you're, you're utilizing to create the twin and BIM and mm-hmm. this is, this gives uh, investors uh, or, or purchasers of, uh, of uh, properties the ability to visualize exactly what it is uh, their opportunity is, and uh, and and uh, by tokenizing it, you're you're documenting this on the blockchain. Mm-hmm. So so anyone in the world can access the information, take a look at the building, and say that looks like a, a building I'm interested in. Totally. And uh, you're you're basically a facilitator of that information transfer from the real property to the tokenization and so then a third party can see it and act upon it make a decision yes am i, am I do i have that understanding correctly yeah yes i think that that's that's where the only wording i'd change there john is we don't do that today <laughs> we, we oh, are, okay. <laughs> but that's 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 the um that's the roadmap for sure today okay. we are what we're saying to clients in the industry is Get yourself at least get your properties digitized. Get them. When I say digitized, that is like we explained. Get them into a intelligent three D building information modeling asset. Then we can start um, slowly, if you want, 
connecting systems to make it a digital twin. Right. Then as Web3 emerges, you're now prime position to start tokenizing, selling data, selling, yeah, selling. Assets. So so in, in terms of the uh, application for cryptocurrency, you talked earlier about the internet of things and you know this part of the building speaks to the other part of the building mm -hmm. and identifies a, a replacement part that's required. It can go online and uh, order the replacement part part and instead of dollars being exchanged mm -hmm. it can access the the company's blockchain deposit and do a swap and pay for it sure is that right totally yeah right can't see why not and right. that's like that's why we're saying and 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 when uh, when the blockchain kicks in and you've got this you've got this transaction that happens within seconds right and it's a secure it's a secure pro process right. that means you, it really is i don't have to touch anything and it will be it will be in my subcontractor's hands tomorrow to go and do that physical the physical change so you're just sitting there and the next day uh, some guy walks in and he said hey bill what are you doing here uh, yeah. oh well your your system told me i had to do this Oh, well, thanks. Okay, I'll see you later. And yep. so everything just basically is looking after itself. So Andy, uh, how do you see this technology evolving going forward? Am I correct in assuming that we'll see further iterations and development of this technology? For sure. Yeah. And I think we're going to see a bit piecemeal here and there. Uh, we're still very much on here in Canada, still very much on the actually getting our clients to be aware of this exists, you know, get yourself digitized. This technology is out there. So that's the first aspect, at least here in Canada, from my experience, is getting that education happening. But I think we're going to find that it, you know, it's kind of like the dot, dot com bubble, right? Many years ago, we're going to see it. It's going to all of a sudden come out of nowhere. And, you know, I know I, I'm, I'm humble enough to say, as I will, the more I venture into this, the more I wish I knew <laughs> more as well, right? It's, it's so fast, immersive, uh, growing, and it's just applications are coming left, right, and center. But what a great place, what a great place to be is property, right? Everyone everyone knows property is a highly valuable um, asset that if we, can, if we can start playing with it, optimizing it, it's got so many benefits just thanks to computer power, AI, optimization. Yeah, I mean, the list goes on. So it just it just makes sense, doesn't it? Like the more the more you talk yeah, about it, it just makes sense. Absolutely, this is the the future and the next phase of uh, of everything is is moving into a more digitally integrated world, uh, for better or for worse, in in some cases. But uh, anyway, Andy, as you can as you can recall from our first meeting in the coffee shop, I thought this was a fascinating topic, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation and. I kind of wish actually we could have recorded it that day because it was just uh, it was so organic and it, it was a, a ton of fun just to uh, just to have that conversation and learn so much about this and learn about the applications. But mm -hmm. I hope our listeners got as much out of today's conversation as I did from that first meeting a couple of weeks ago. So I or a couple of months ago. So uh, if people want to get in touch with you and find a little bit more about your work and uh, and how mm -hmm. to uh, get in touch with you, where should they go? Sure, we got. Um, you can find us on our, our websites. Pretty, uh, pretty comprehensive of our services. That's just digital dot inc, digital dot inc. Um, we've got LinkedIn, and um, but yeah, otherwise, yeah, happy to happy to take any calls. Happy to chat. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been on your website, Andy, and it is quite um, interactive and uh, very enlightening to see it. How, how everything you've discussed visually. So I encourage people to go on that website to, mm. to take a look at some of the visuals. Uh, they're quite impressive. Yeah. And to, and to, yeah. Thanks, John. And the, the, the frustrating thing about our line of business is it's very rare. We're allowed to show what we do <laughs> due to confidentiality. Uh, right. You know, I can talk about Roger Center, but I'm not allowed to post anything yeah. online, right. you know, show right. video. So it's, yeah, it's frustrating, but um, because we, it'd be great to show everything we can do, but uh you know, hey ho. Yeah. Even correct? some of those renderings though, Andy. I just I, I had it on in the background yesterday. I was making some phone calls and it was just going through that video of all the different buildings that you've created, uh, uh yeah. building information models for and uh it was it was fascinating to just sit there and look at them and, and visualize because like I know a lot of those buildings in person and to see the, the digital recreation was impressive. So mm. um yeah. anyway, I'm gonna uh, turn it back over to Bill to uh, wrap up here. 
Wow. This was really interesting. I, I'm a big fan of science fiction. I've been reading it all my life. And I felt like kind of I was in a science fiction episode. Uh, <laughs> 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 it is fascinating where we have gone with technology and the things that are that are now being made possible that I, you know, when I was a kid, you didn't dare even imagine such things were possible. So thanks, Andy. Really appreciate it. Interesting conversation. John and Alex, before we bail out of here, uh, for the listeners who want to reach out to y'all, what is the best way for them to get a hold of you? Uh, best way is just to send us an email, info at med-wealth.ca. And if anybody wants to get information on our other contact uh, methodologies, they can go on our website, which is www.med-wealth.ca. Yeah, and that information's downstairs in the uh, show notes as well, right, John? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I, to uh, elaborate a little bit on uh, Alexander's answer, we also have a, an events page on our website and where we document future upcoming uh, presentations. So I would encourage people to go on our events page and take a look at that. Yeah, fantastic. And I would encourage people to hit the subscribe button. <laughs> if you are not already a subscriber to the podcast, it's easy. Just hit subscribe. That way you don't miss another episode of this fascinating podcast. And if you like it, tell people about it. Spread word about it. Help get the word out about the podcast and what and what's going on over here. Because uh, there have been a number of really interesting conversations uh, that you probably want to go back and check out. Specifically the one about with Skylar talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and uh, blockchain technology, which is a fascination of mine. Thank you, guys. And thanks, John. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Andy. And on behalf of everybody at MedWealth, I'm Bill Tucker, urging you to remember this simple fact. You can go out and make today a great day or not. It's your choice. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to Prescribing Prosperity. Visit our website at med-wealth.ca. That's med-wealth.ca for more information or to connect with us for a consultation. Don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the hosts and their guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of IPC Securities Corporation. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investment advice. Always seek the advice of a qualified and licensed financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment or retirement planning. MedWealth Financial Services can provide a private consultation to help you determine the suitability of any guidance discussed on the show.